It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 265 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 28th of May 2017. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Dr. Shane Joseph. G'day. Penny Dumsday. Hello. And planetary scientist Dr. Helen Maynard Casely. Welcome back. Thank you. Hello. How are you doing, Helen? What's been happening since we last spoke to you? You went on holiday, I know. Yeah, I went back to see all my folks, um, which was pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, things have just been pottering along, really, keeping keeping myself really busy. Do you want to tell us about the uh, the first lot of results that we've got in from the Juno spacecraft orbiting Jupiter? We haven't really talked about Juno all that much on the show. I think we were going to do a big special when it first launched or, or got into orbit, but that fell through. So we've got a a spacecraft orbiting around Jupiter, and it's just done some really cool manoeuvres. What's happened? Well, yeah, so Juno arrived, I think, last year and uh, managed to insert itself quite successfully into quite a dramatic orbit around Jupiter. And it's quite dramatic because it goes incredibly close to the giant planet um, before going ridiculously far away. Um, It's a bit of a a death orbit. It will never get out of that orbit, and there's only one ending of it, in that's inside Jupiter. But hopefully that's not going to happen for a few years yet. yet. Um, Interestingly, Cassini has just entered a similar death orbit. And so at the moment we have this very, you know, very unique thing where we can suddenly compare Jupiter and Saturn like never before. Um, in real time. <laughs> yeah, in pretty much in real time. I think a lot of people have thought that we know quite a lot about Jupiter. It's a big planet. We've certainly, well, we sent the Galileo spacecraft there. But unfortunately, Galileo mainly told us about um, the icy moons. It's the only reason we know anything really about um, um, worlds like Europa, Io, and Ganymede and Callisto. What um, you probably don't hear about because NASA don't talk about it was because it was meant to do what Juno's doing on Jupiter however a lot of its instruments got fried when it got too close to Jupiter because I don't think they were quite ready for Jupiter's magnetic field to be as big as it was and it it did damage a lot of instruments and then they had to sort of re-change everything they also were never able to use their big um their big antenna for Galileo so they had to really work and this is where they came up with the idea of compressing data to send down which of course worked very well um, for New Horizons so there was a mm. it was one of those um, worked really well however it means that we really didn't know very much about Jupiter and so that's what Juno has gone to do it's not going to look at the icy moons at all it's just going to concentrate on the the big the big planet and um it's been, apps, I mean, the first, it's been there, what, for a year or so, and the first science papers came out this week, along with some just astounding photos. I think mm-hmm. if, if listeners haven't been and seen these photos yet, do themselves a favour, go on the NASA Juno site and just be amazed by them. Um, yeah, the truth and, has. <laughs> yeah, it just absolutely, it's like a Van Gogh painting. It's just absolutely <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm getting quite emotional about them now. But also on the, the NASA page today, I noticed they had a really nice little Tumblr article about the big things that they found scientifically. And there's about five or six of them, one of which is there's amazing cyclones, which are giving this beautiful Van Gogh quality to the, to the clouds of Jupiter. Um, there's a few other results that they found, um, one being that the magnetic field was yet bigger than they ever even anticipated again. So it's a much more dangerous place than they thought. So I should say that in Juno, they've worked really hard to radiation shield a lot of their instruments. Um, They're sort of buried in the side of it. But the thing that really um, uh, picked my eye, and I I need to read up a bit more about it, is this new result from the gravity. Um, so when you go past a, um, a big planet or even any planet, 
you can actually monitor how your spacecraft wobbles. And this, <laughs> uh, and this gives you uh, an insight into the gravity field of the planet and the insides of the planet. Now, um, it would seem that from the wobble of Juno, that uh, the inside of Jupiter is a lot different to what we ever thought. So um, the current theory at the moment is there's an incredibly dense core right at the, right the centre. Now the evidence from the gravity is that the core is more fuzzy. There's sort of more mm. spread of material, spread of mass through the planet. And um, this, of course, is quite exciting, I think, because I think that strengthens the case for there being metallic hydrogen there. And then the other nice thing is that the metallic hydrogen, it, I should say, is a material that we've never made in the lab. I'm going to actually say that, even though some people this year, <laughs> they have. Um, Has it been published uh, yet? Uh, it was published in, where was it published? Oh gosh, it was it hit the news earlier on this year that mm. metallic hydrogen was made, but unfortunately it's I'm not I read the paper and I wasn't uber convinced. Ah, and I'm right. not the only one of my peers who is not uber convinced by it. Right. Um, so yeah. But yeah, so this is amazing material that potentially the nice thing is that it could also that ties in with the strong magnetic field because in order to have a big magnetic field like that you need something weird and wonderful driving it mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's what metallic hydrogen could be that's i thought cool. that was the leading theory anyway that it was metallic hydrogen at the core of jupiter it was uh, that yeah. not well, as rock a uh, rock solid a theory as i thought it was well, no, certainly we thought it was there. Well, the, the theory is that it's there. It was just, it didn't quite tie with this very dense inner core mm -hmm. because um, the dense inner core suggests something that, that, for want of a better term, it's sort of beyond, the pressures are just beyond, we, we sort of have no idea what material is at that point. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. that, that sort of densities we're talking um, you know, it's not. It's 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 super solid, but it's it's not. It's not neutrons, protons, and electrons. It's just stuff, and mm -hmm. it's probably not very mobile stuff. Whereas this whole idea that the mass is more distributed suggests that there is a, a bigger scope for for metallic hydrogen to exist in this area. So I think um, I think it only strengthens it rather than. And um, the really dense core was one of those ones where people were getting a bit philosophical about, you know, <laughs> what is actual, what is the material actual, uh, those sorts of pressures that you would expect for a dense core like that. Yeah. Maybe it's made of some unknown matter that is sort of dark to our uh, understanding of, no, no, I'm trying to get a dark matter reference in there. No, no yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, you, and you failed it. You failed. I mean, one oh. big theory for a while was that it was, well, for Uranus and Neptune, they think sometimes that if it does have a dense inner core like this, that it could be diamond because there's a lot of um, methane in their in their um, mantles, and that the methane, which is um, CH4, would break down to just the carbon, the C, and the hydrogen separately. Um, I don't think um, people are thinking that way for Jupiter and Saturn anymore. So. Oh. Very cool. And I think uh, is it, there is a glitch with um, some of the engine valves or something, which is meaning the Juno probe is not doing the the plan that we had originally intended to. It's, it's doing another loop every 53 days or something rather than getting down to 14. Is that right? Yeah, I seem to remember that. I'm casting my mind back that when they first inserted, it didn't go exactly to plan. And there's probably a lot of it is because of, you know, Jupiter is just... Mm -hmm. A little bit unknown. They were flying into the dark, um, and so they probably had to modify a bit on the fly. There was a bit of a worry that they weren't going to be able to do as much science straight away. Um, but I think I think these papers have shown that no, they're they're smashing out their science yeah. goals. No, they're doing great. It's very cool. All right, Shane. Uh, well, many people this week would have been shocked at some of the headlines they read about the seed vault in Svalbard, uh, which is the Arctic stronghold of world seeds flooded after permafrost melts. I think that was in The Guardian. Uh, so this is basically a 
survival technique, I guess, that we've done where we're storing copies of every different type of seed uh, in a pristine vault uh, in the Arctic with the idea that should, you know, we wipe out a strain of uh, some particular seeds or something goes catastrophically wrong, we can then repopulate the earth Mm. with seeds that we are currently using. And so there was a bit of permafrost that leaked and was the vault flooded? Are we all doomed? Do we have to start again now? What happened? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, no, it's not. (laughs) It's fine. Short story. (laughs) The the vault is going to be fine. Probably. Um, There was a nice... Before I go on to explain a bit more, there's a nice little quote, um, and I'll quote directly from the article, from a guy called Fowler, who is, I think, the... uh, Who is Fowler? Kerry Fowler, who helped he helped create it. So they did a back of the envelope cal- calculation. They said, if all the ice in the world melted, all the ice, every single last bit of it, and we had the world's largest recorded tsunami right in front of the seed vault, what would happen to the seed vault? Well, we found that the seed vault would still be five to seven stories above that point of water. <laughs> so it, it's going to so be fairly safe. It's safe. <laughs> I mean, the, what? What? See, when I've when I've read a few stories about this sea vault before all this happened, just because you know it's a really fascinating concept. The idea that you know we lock away all of our important agricultural and I think culturally important seeds in a place like the Arctic, where it's probably going to be safe um, in the in the in the event of you know human cast- catastrophe, which let's face it, looking at the news every day is getting more and more likely. Um, but the way they've built this is actually quite fascinating. And I hadn't realised just how much thought had gone into this, and I, and I probably should have realised this. But the way it's built is that it's, yeah, it's, it's on top of like a, of a hill. And to get to the vault, you've got to go into a tunnel, go down, downhill about 100 metres and then go uphill. So if you've got to do that, water has to do the same thing. Now, water will have to... So what happened in this case is there's, there's, there's permafrost melting because, as we all know, Climate change is occurring, and more and more permafrost is not so much permafrost anymore as as, as it is water. Um, but and so every year there's a little bit of leakage into the tunnel from the front of it as the summer hits and all the rest of it. But it wasn't as much. It's and I think it's getting worse. And I think this year it became yeah okay this the floor was slick with ice and all the rest of it. But the important thing is that it became ice again. It flooded into the tunnel and then it became ice because it's still minus eighteen degrees. So the point is that <laughs> yes, water flooded in, but it then became ice again, and that's not going to affect the seed vault because it's as you said, as that quote, as I demonstrated before, said, even if all the ice in the world melted and every single you know we lost all of our ice, that thing would still be sticking out on top of the water, and it would be fine. Yeah. So water has to get in and then go all the way downhill a hundred meters yeah. without freezing. Yeah. And then go, and then uphill, go uphill again a large amount, still without freezing. Still without freezing. At minus 18 degrees. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe if it was highly salty water or something, there was something done to yeah. low, to raise its freezing point. No, or lower its freezing point. Or, 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 <laughs> it's very dangerous to get into the seeds because you just like, you know, massive shoot. Boop, up. <laughs> <laughs> So we needn't worry too much. No, I mean uh, a bit of sensationalist reporting. Who would yeah, have thought? And look, I, I saw it being I, I saw it being sort of shared around Facebook a lot, and I thought, oh. hmm. and, and, and I, I sort of bought into it. As well. I thought, oh god, here we go. You know, great. The irony is yeah. is overwhelming here. But then, when you, but you know, when, when you've got a Snopes page dedicated to it, it's yeah. It, it, I think <laughs> I think the seeds are going to be fine. To be honest, I mean, it's it's. I, I like the fact that this story is drawn attention to this project again because it's a really fascinating project. That's true. That's true. I think it's cool that people are aware of it who might otherwise have not have been it's aware of it. It's also nice to realise that people care. I mean, the, the mm-hmm. you can take the thing from the Facebook sharing that it just means people are like, oh, no, we can't do this. Yeah, they did, which, yeah. There's, there's part of that. I think it's also part of people just going... <laughs> The world is burning. Everything's terrible. And and there's a, a cycle that a lot of people seem to be getting into that where they'll just post everything that's wrong and everything that's bad. But I'm glad that this case was uh, fake news, as it were. Okay, Penny, uh, this sounds like a bad joke, but why are flamingos more stable on one leg than two? <laughs> oh, it does sound like a bad joke. And you can have... Another bad joke, why is a dead flamingo more stable than a living one? Mmm. Whoa. 
So, no. <laughs> that well, like this a is joke. interesting. <laughs> this is not a joke. It's kind of a bit macabre. Um, so this is just some research that has been done looking at how flamingos can balance. And before we even say anything, the flamingos that the dead flamingo that I mentioned was one that had died of some other cause. Um, it had been euthanized because of very bad health at a zoo and um, donated their bodies to science. So no flamingos were sort of <laughs> sacrificed to answer this critical question. <laughs> um, yeah, so it turns out that flamingos are so stable on one leg that, in fact, they sleep standing on one leg without any muscular activity and they can do it even when they're dead. So if you pose a flamingo corpse or a flamingo cadaver on one leg, it is so stable it will stand there and it can even be tilted to about 45 degrees, it's still stable. That is so, so spooky. That is amazing. <laughs> now, what I thought was really interesting, actually there's a few things that are quite interesting. <laughs> um, one of the things was how this was studied. I, mean, I might talk about how the study worked before I talk about what actually happens. Um, so they got a thing called a, a force plate, which is kind of like a scale, but it measures the force that a foot exerts. So... What they had to do is just put flamingos on this force plate and wait for them to fall asleep, which was quite boring, um, apparently. <laughs> mm. So when flamingos were standing on one leg and they did fall asleep, they actually became more stable as they lost consciousness. Um, their bodies swayed less and its centre of gravity moved only by millimetres. So it's really, really, really steady. Um, they contacted a local zoo. No one remembered a flamingo ever falling over. And even animals, you know, that we think of as being quite agile, like cats, for example. I'm sure that anyone with a pet <laughs> cat has seen them do all sorts of stupid stuff. Like, yeah, that's what the internet's for. That's what the that's internet it. is for. And I, I don't know. I'm <laughs> sure if you do a YouTube search for flamingos falling over, you'll find something. But they are very, very stable. Now yeah, I've got to look. <laughs> okay, we'll just Shane will be back. Um, <laughs> Falling through sorry. ice. Okay, sorry. Continue. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> so um, to understand what's happening, you have to think about a bird's leg. And to us it looks like their legs bend backwards, like their knees mm. go backwards the other way that us do. But even though birds have the same bones in their leg or the same sort of pattern of bones in their leg that we do, the proportions are quite different and it's, more similar, I think, in a way to a cat's leg. So the knee of the bird is actually, or the flamingo is like actually way up high <coughs> and it's hidden by the feathers. You can't really see it. So the thing we think of as a backwards knee is actually the ankle or it would be equivalent oh. to our ankle. Oh, and yeah. then the, the claws are sort of the toes. And cats have a similar kind of leg. So if you look at a cat's leg, it's actually standing up on its toes, what looks like its backwards knee would actually be equivalent to our whole foot if that was all down. And I'm, no, I'm mm -hmm. not really making sense. And then the thigh. So the flamingo no. is kind of the same. A dog's the same, sorry to interrupt. Is that a similar I kind think, of thing? Or? Yeah, I think they probably would be. I just, yeah. I'm not really a dog person. So have a, have a look at a dog's leg. And if no, it I'm, sort I'm of looks I'm like it has. Yeah. Two knees. I just can't help but think that every, all these animals would have problems playing head, shoulders, knees and toes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking all the animals are probably, hang on, no, our legs are the right way around. It's humans that have the knees that are around the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. think about horses. Normally not then. <laughs> A horse essentially stands on its, um, its middle finger's nail. Ah. So if, oh, if, yeah, it gets does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a favourite biology teacher topic, by the way. How all the vertebrates we have these same bones, and if you look at a whale's flipper or a human's hand or a bat's wing, it's like oh, that looks a bit familiar. Anyway, so what happens in a flamingo leg? So when the flamingo stands on one leg, its leg sort of um, angles, so the foot is becomes directly under the centre of the body, and the centre of mass moves to just in front of that flamingo's knee so it's actual up high knee um the one that's hidden 
So what happens is the body weight pulls the hip and the knee forward and so combined with um, gravity, everything kind of locks into place. So these mm-hmm. birds are able to be really, really stable. In fact, they're more stable on one leg than two. They're more stable when they're unconscious than when they're conscious because it's such a strong locking system. And it's interesting um, why they do it. You might think, oh, that would conserve a lot of energy uh, if you don't have to activate your muscles in order to stand up. That's good. But the birds... Um, don't really stand one-legged often. Um, They're more likely to stand on one leg on cool days or if they're in the water. So it seems like they're probably doing it to reduce um, heat loss through their legs. So both two legs in water will lose um, more heat than one Ah. leg in water. And if they've got one leg tucked up, it's probably, you know, keeping a bit closer to their body and staying a bit warmer. Mm. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. (laughs) <laughs> very cool but you have missed the one important quote from that article though i think penny i think is, i might have i think uh, I have quote your meaning <laughs> it's it's the pull quote yeah one of the uh, researchers was asked um which one lena ting which does she prefer working with she usually studies human balance does she prefer working with humans or flamingos and the pull quote that um, I think this was, oh, yeah, this was an Ed Yong article that Ed chose to go with was uh, <laughs> the flamingos, when they fall asleep, sometimes they projectile poop. Oh, God. So I would imagine that that <laughs> delightfully, yeah. what I imagine is quite a high-tech um, force plate room was, <laughs> yeah. That is. Yeah, don't stand behind them. <laughs> no. Right. Uh, that's very cool. Uh, extraordinary the way evolution adapts to things that you like you i wouldn't have even thought about a heat loss thing and you've got both feet in the water you're going to get cold i would never have even thought of uh lifting one leg out and a locking mechanism and all that it's very very cool it is really cool yeah all right shane uh if we are to start colonizing space uh, at the current technology we're at, it's going to take a very long time to get anywhere important. So we're going to be talking about generational spaceships. We're going to be talking about having children in space and then those children will pilot the spaceship and everything. (laughs) How do we even know if we can reproduce in space? Mm. I guess the answer is obviously we test it on mice as with everything. Yeah. Do you want to tell us about space mice? Well, yeah. So, first of all, this wasn't about getting mice, live mice up there and letting them mate because as I think I've, – I've read a few articles and a few interviews with astronauts and the inevitable question is always, can you have sex up there? Mm-hmm. And their answer is, you know what? You wouldn't want to. The, it would be messy. Very, very messy. Um, so It's messy down here too, I think. Well, you know, at least here we've got <laughs> gravity and it all goes one way. Up there, yeah. <laughs> now, remember, Shane, this is a family podcast. Yeah, we're, we're, we're moving on. We haven't got the explicit rating on I said on nothing iTunes. obscene. I said nothing obscene. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the point is that um, Ed, Ed did raise a, a very important point. If we're going to explore space at the current rate of technology, it's going to take years and years and years to get anywhere. So it's going to be... Not our generation that goes anywhere, but our you know future yeah. generation. So the question is, can we breed in space? Um, and the, one of the major major issues is the is the um, issue of cosmic radiation, and does this actually affect sperm, spermatozoa and eggs and all the rest of it? So what this Japanese group did was they actually sent freeze dried mouse sperm up onto the ISS, um, and they allowed it to basically be exposed to the same level of cosmic radiation that everything on that thing is. Subjected to, which is about a hundred times more than we have on Earth, um, so it's you know it's quite high. Um, they brought these back, I think, about a few years later, or no, so one year, one year later. So it was a year of being exposed to this cosmic radiation. They used the sperm to artificially inseminate, well, to sorry, to fertilize um, eggs in vitro, and they implant, implanted those into female mice. And they actually found that, to be honest, that the birth rate, the successful birth conception and birth rate was actually about the same. And what they did find was that there was some DNA damage because of the radiation, but it seems to have been corrected or at least, um, okay. yeah, sort of repaired, which 
makes a bit of sense because our, de- our body has, you know, our cells have DNA repair mechanisms and they can detect this. What's interesting is that this stuff that was actually implanted in vitro and, and then in vivo was actually subjected to the same processes. So, in essence, it might not be... I mean, if, if, assuming this then extrapolates to humans and all the rest of it, um, it does sort of raise a few hopes that, well, maybe cosmic radiation isn't such a deleterious effect as we thought it was. Maybe. I mean, this is just one step in a series of experiments you need to do. You also would need to send the eggs up into space, yeah. have them brought back That's down, true. test that, yeah, and then do the whole fertilisation process in space mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a number of places said, where we have it. problems. That NASA now offer um, egg and sperm freezing to all their astronauts of fertile age still. Mm. So... Whereas obviously it's more normal that most astronauts will have had their children before they before they leave, but um, mm-hmm. but it does sound like you know they're aware of this issue and so they've been taking precautions for a wee while anyway. And uh, I think at the end of the day, the egg is actually a much bigger target than the sperm. Yeah, so it's true. The chances yeah. for damage. I don't know. I'm I'm not a biologist, but I would have thought the chances for damage is a bit more. Um, I'm, yeah, see, I'm not sure if it would be, to be honest, because I'm, it, it's, I mean, the radiation, I'm assuming, you know, like, it doesn't, it, you know, to radiation, a sperm, to radi- unless the sperm, a, sper- a sperm as well has a much more resistant outer layer than an egg. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and, I, and I'm not sure if it, and I'm not sure if it does. So, but you're right. Mm-hmm. The next step would be to yeah, to, to take eggs out there and see if the same thing happens, and then to see, yeah, see if you can get like an in vivo fertilization, in vitro fertilization. In space, that would be the next um, step. And lucky yeah. mice. Yeah, but of course, <laughs> as we always say, humans are not mice, and just yeah, cause, of course, just because they were able to deliver healthy mice pups here, doesn't mean the same would happen in humans or anything. Of course, and the but other- it's it's part of a series of experiments that we need to do. That's all. Yeah. Oh, I, I just the other thing that I, I, I wanted to mention was that well, you know, the radiation here, you know, is going to be different to like say deep space. You know, say, sure. say, say theoretically you get out of the, yeah. um, you know, out of our, um, earth cloud or whatever, and you get into the inter- interstellar medium, and it's much, much worse what happens then. Yeah, I was going to so, say actually, yeah. even the ISS is shielded to some extent mm. by our magnetic field. At the end yeah. of the day, it's only 200 miles above us. Yes. Um, the Apollo astronauts were subjected to a whole load more because they actually were the few that have left Earth's magnetic mm. field. So mm. it's almost like they've not dosed it enough, really. Like Because I suppose the thing is it's, you know, we're looking at Martian colonisation. So yes. yeah. that, that's going to be a big feature. And it, it's one of the things that I think is holding, well, that and the money that's holding back Mars exploration at the moment is this concern. That's why we need a moon base. Yep. But you know, didn't I hear that Trump wanted to get it out, get them out there by next year or something? Or? <laughs> uh, there was an awkward conversation <laughs> with uh, uh, Helen, who was the the woman who's just been the longest time in space or something. Um, Peggy, um, oh, what's her surname? <sighs> She's yeah. But anyway, she was <laughs> having a conversation with the president. Yes, who said, uh, yeah. So when are you guys going to Mars? She was kind of awkward and like, well, you're, you've just slashed all our budget. So, um, <laughs> so not, not anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, thanks, Don. Yeah. 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 Uh, and what a happy note to end on. Thanks yeah. for that, Shane. <laughs> think of something. <laughs> um, no, nah, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> World sucks. Sp- Go look at the judo photos. They'll make you happy. Yeah. Definitely check them out. We'll put links in the show notes because they are extraordinary, particularly the, particularly the one of the South Pole, which is yeah. just... I mean, that's, I mean, the contrast <laughs> with Saturn is just incredible because Saturn has a famous hexagon yeah. on its pole. And it, I suppose people just figured, yeah, it's going to be a bit like that in Jupiter, but no, mm. it's <laughs> off the scale. <laughs> All right, well... F- Those links and everything else that we talked about today are going to be on the show notes at scienceontop.com slash 265. If you go there, you can also leave a comment or you can find us on social media. And if you like the show and you want us to make more, just go to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledge some money on Patreon. 
Whether you donate just $1 per episode or 20, it all helps. So thanks to everyone who's chipped in already. And a big thank you to Dr. Helen Maynard Casely. A pleasure as ever. Thank you very much for having me. Are you still writing at theconversation.com? I should be. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So that's a promise that Helen's going to be doing a lot more writing in the near future. So check that out. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Thank you for joining me today, Shane and Penny. No worries, Matt. Thanks, Ed. This episode was edited with insufferable glee and smugness by Marcos (laughs) Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Uh, But water is such a uh, precious resource up here that we also uh, are cleaning up our urine and making it drinkable. And it's really not as bad as it sounds. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) Better you than me. Tell me, uh, Mars, what do you see a timing for actually sending humans to Mars? Is there a schedule? And when would you see that happening? Well, I think as your bill directed, it'll be approximately in the 2030s. The, as I mentioned, we actually are building hardware to test the new heavy launch vehicle. And this vehicle will take us further than we've ever been away from this planet. So, uh, Unfortunately, spaceflight takes a lot of time and money, so uh, getting there will require some international cooperation to get the, the, it to be a planet-wide uh, approach in order to make it successful, just because it is a very expensive endeavor, but it is so worthwhile doing. Well, we want to try and do it during my first term, or at worst, during my second term, so we'll have to speed that up a little bit, okay? <laughs> we'll do our best.